sacrifice we're one sinners unified by grace bound together look what god has done by his spirit through his son by the power of his hand he is sending Listen, it's great to be with everybody who's worshiping with us today on all of our regional campuses and those of you who are worshiping with us on the web, man, we're glad to have you with us as well. This is a really exciting weekend for us here at Compassion Christian for a number of reasons. First of all, this is the last weekend that Late Church will be held downtown at the Lucas Theater. Uh, Next weekend, we're moving back to the Savannah Theater where we launched that campus 11 years ago. The name will be Compassion Christian Downtown next week. Savannah Theater, let's thank God for Lake Church, amen? One last time, (laughs) one last time. All right, in addition to that, this is the first week I have the opportunity to welcome everybody to Compassion Christian Church. It's great to have you here. For the last couple years, we've been struggling with the fact that our ministry has just outgrown our name, and honestly, I think at the depth of our heart, that's been the hope of every one of us. You know, every one of us who knows Jesus in a life-changing way hopes you know, all of our family and friends will come to know Jesus in a life-changing way. And you know what? If the church is too far away for them to drive here, well, let's start one over there. Uh, and if they live in a country where the church is not uh, strong, let's, let's build a strong church there. Uh, and if they go to a university where there's not a great campus ministry, let's start one of those. And friends, we've been doing that for the last 52 years. And the outcome of that passion for Christ is a ministry that reaches far beyond the city limits of Savannah and far beyond the borders of Chatham County. And can I just say, friends, that when the church is working right, it's always been that way. It's always been that way. Man, the love of Christ just compels us to share his love with people who live with us uh, and live near us, and frankly, people who live countries away from us. And man, when the church is working right, that's how it is. Now, I want you to just take a minute with me and think back about the relentless way that the church of Jesus Christ has pushed its way across ethnic boundaries and national borders and geographical barriers because the love of Christ has compelled us. In 30 AD, the church exploded onto the scene on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem and people from 17 different linguistic groups heard the gospel that day in their own language and put their faith in Jesus and over 3,000 of them were baptized into him. Eight years later in 38 AD, the apostle Peter travels to the Roman outpost in Israel called Caesarea to the home of an Italian soldier named Cornelius. And he shares the gospel about Jesus with Cornelius and his family. And Cornelius was the first non-Jewish person to be led to a life-changing relationship with Jesus by a key leader of the church. And friends, when that racial barrier shattered in the hearts of Christ followers in Israel, it launched a global expansion of the church. In 42 AD, the apostle Mark goes south to Egypt. In 49 AD, the apostle Paul goes north to Turkey. In 51 AD, Paul leaves Turkey to go west to Greece, and the apostle John moves to Turkey with mother, with the mother Mary, the mother of Jesus, where she died in Ephesus in the home of the apostle John. 
In 52 AD, the Apostle Thomas heads to India where the gospel literally transformed the sociology of the southern half of India. And if you want to hear about it sometime, I'll be glad to talk with you about that. 54 AD, the Apostle Paul launches his third and final missionary journey where he ends his life in Rome as a martyr before they kill him. He leads a number of the soldiers who guard him to Christ before he is beheaded. In 174 AD, reports come out of Austria that there are Christians way up north there. In 280 AD, the first rural churches begin to emerge in northern Italy. Christianity now is no longer exclusively an urban phenomenon. Now it's spreading out into the countryside, which is very significant. In 350 AD, 31.7 million, roughly 53% of the Roman Empire, claims to be followers of Jesus. In 432 AD, Patrick heads to Ireland to take the gospel to the people on the Emerald Isle. In Savannah, we celebrate that great missionary venture every year by dressing in green and getting smashed. <laughs> Not sure Patrick would approve, but that's the way we roll, all right? Uh, 596 AD, Gregory the Great sends Augustine and a team of missionaries to what is now England to reintroduce the gospel, and missionaries settle in Canterbury and within the first two years baptize 10,000 people into Christ. In 635 A.D., first Christian missionaries arrive in China. 740 A.D., Irish monks sail to Iceland. 900 A.D., missionaries reach Norway. 1200 A.D., the Bible is now available in 22 different languages. 1498, the first Christians are reported in Kenya. In 1501, Pope Alexander VI grants to the crown of Spain all the newly discovered countries in America on the condition that provisions be made for the religious instruction of the natives. In 1537, Pope Paul III orders the Indians of the New World to be brought to Jesus by the preaching of the divine word and the example of a godly life. In 1554, 1,500 converts to Christianity are reported in what we now call Thailand. In 1630, an attempt is made in El Paso, Texas to establish a mission among the Mesos Indians. In 1666, John Eliot publishes his Indian Grammar, a book written to assist in the conversion, the conversion work among the Indians in Massachusetts. 1671, Quaker missionaries arrive in the Carolinas. 1743, David Brainerd starts a ministry to the Delaware Indians in New Jersey, dies at the age of 52 of cancer in the home of Jonathan Edwards. 1770, John Merritt, a free black man in New York City, begins ministering cross-culturally, preaching to the American Indians. In 1773, a godly general with the British army named James Oglethorpe is sent from England to start a colony that would be called the city of Savannah. In just the first few years, John Wesley comes to Savannah to serve at Christ Church, has an experience there that eventually leads him to full devotion to Jesus, and then God used him to launch the extremely evangelistic movement called Methodism, and by the end of the 1800s, seven out of ten Americans would claim to be Methodist. The oldest African-American church in America was founded about that same time, First African Baptist Church in Savannah, Georgia, a church whose first pastor, George Lyle, was a slave. That church became part of the Underground Railroad. My friend, Pastor Tillman Thurman, serves that church to this day. 1740, George Whitfield, one of the most famous preachers in England, comes to Savannah and founds the Bethesda Boys Home, a, a, the longest serving home for orphan children in America. 60 years later, in 1801, a Presbyterian pastor in Pennsylvania by the name of Thomas Campbell, the pastor I was named after, came to the conviction that God never called him to be a Presbyterian. He got call, only called him to be a Christian. And consequently, he could have fellowship and minister with any other Christian who acknowledged the lordship of Jesus and the authority of the Bible, regardless of whether they were part of his denomination or not. In fact, he came to believe that denominationalism did more to divide the body of Christ than provide any kind of useful service. And that conviction led to the launch of a wave of non-denominational churches that simply call themselves Christian churches, not any particular brand of Christians, just Christians. And they believed that the Bible was the guidance of God on every issue and that every congregation had a responsibility to keep their church accountable to the Bible and the Lordship of Jesus. They taught that where the Bible speaks, we should speak. They taught that where the Bible is silent, we should be silent. They taught that, where there, that there should be unity among all Christ followers on every matter of faith, and there should be freedom in matters of opinion and in all things love. And this fresh approach became the fastest growing faith movement in America in the 1800s. In 1964, an intrepid little group of New Testament believers started one of those non-denominational churches on the growing south side of Savannah and call it Savannah Christian Church. And 52 years later, impossible as it seems, that little church in this little community 
became one of the 100 largest and fastest growing churches in America, according to Outreach Magazine, and changed its name to Compassion Christian Church. Amen. <laughs> Boom. <clears throat> now, here's what we need to remember. Throughout history, there is an unbroken chain of humble, obedient followers of Jesus who will face any boundary, who will break any barrier, who will cross any border because the love of Jesus compels them. And that chain stretches from our church in Savannah and Rankin and Statesboro and Midway all the way back to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And friends, that's why we changed our name from Savannah Christian to Compassion Christian because, friends, the love of Jesus compels us to position our ministry to meet, reach as many people as possible, as fast as possible, just like the New Testament church. Now, how do we do that? How do we reach our world with the love of Christ? I mean, do we need to become experts on strategy and planning and execution? And that's all good. That's just stewardship. Do we need to become experts on video and social media and advertising? That's all good. That's just communication. Do we need to become experts on building buildings and real estate management? Well, it's nice to be able to worship inside when it's 100 degrees and a 95% humidity. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Man, thank God for air conditioning. Amen. <laughs> I'm telling you. But friends, none of those things explain why the gospel has literally swept relentlessly around the world, era after era, and is still sweeping across the world today. The one trait that describes Jesus and the one trait that empowers his followers and leads people to Jesus is the compassion of Jesus. Jesus taught his followers, you are the light of the world. You know, it's not might be the light of the world, could be the light of the world. One day, hopefully, you'll be the light of the world. He didn't say that. He said, you are the light of the world. You are a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. And in the same way, let your light shine before men so that they will see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, look at this. This is really important. What is the light that shines before men and brings praise to our Father in heaven? It is the good deeds that we do because we have been moved by compassion. Those compassion-driven deeds are the light that Jesus says will shine through the church so that the world will see him and give glory to our God in heaven. Friends, beautiful buildings and effective ministry plans and budgets are critical. They're critical. But they do not draw anybody to Jesus. It is when those buildings are filled with followers of Jesus who love like Jesus that's what fills these buildings over and over and over again. It is the compassionate love of Christ moving the heart of every follower of Christ. That love is what shines before men so that they bring glory to our Father in heaven. That's why followers of Jesus deliberately sacrifice their own time and energy and resources to help other people for no personal gain. In fact, they do it when it costs them and they don't even want to be recognized for it. You try to praise them and they'll deflect. They'll say, look, I'm only doing for somebody else what Jesus did for me. That's why Christ followers deliberately cross ethnic barriers and cultural barriers and generational barriers to build bridges in a world that is just filled with gates and moats and fences. This is why Christ followers walk into prisons and reach out to people they don't know. This is why Christ followers with education will sit down with a little boy or girl from a family that's not providing that. This is why a Christ follower who owns a really comfortable home will pick up a hammer and build one for somebody who doesn't have one. This is why a young, healthy, busy Christ follower will walk into a facility and sit beside the bed of an elderly person that everybody else in the world has forgotten. This is why Christ followers who work hard all week will take a Sunday afternoon and serve food to the homeless and distribute blankets when it's cold and food when it's hungry and take food to people under the bridges in our community. And you know, I hear people in the culture talk about helping the hopeless a lot. It's just nice to see a church that actually does it and compassion compels us to do it. This is why you as a Christ follower make sacrifices of your money and your time so that in Africa we can drill wells and provide clean water for little kids who've never had it in their life. In India, we use those dollars to provide orphanages for children in need. In Ecuador and Guatemala, we share the gospel. We also put into place ministries that will lead young men and young women out of the, domestic, out of the horrors of domestic abuse and transform their lives to lives of grace and peace and honor. Friends, when the church is working right, and I'll be the first one to admit the church doesn't always work right, this church doesn't always work right. But man, when it does, it is a compassion incubator. And those good deeds bring praise to our Father in heaven. Friends, think of the light 
that we could bring to Savannah and Rankin and Statesboro and Richmond Hill and Hinesville and, and Midway and on and on and on when every compassion Christian is choosing compassion every day. Let's read this verse together. Big voice. This is like a war cry for our church. Y'all ready? Here we go. Battle cry. Come on. A new commandment I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, friends, compassion is generally associated with deep feelings. But with Jesus, compassion was a precursor to action. Man, when he felt compassion, he went to work. Now, you look at a couple passages in the New Testament where Jesus is moved by compassion. Matthew chapter 20. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. He felt something. He did something. Mark chapter 1. Filled with compassion. Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. He felt compassion. He did something. Mark chapter 6, when Jesus saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things. He felt compassion and it moved him to action. In the prodigal son story, Jesus describes the Lord God as a compassionate dad. And he says his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. He felt compassion and expressed that compassion in love. And the idea of compassion is that your heart goes out to people because you learn to see them the way Jesus sees them, and then you choose to love them the way Jesus loved them. And so in the time that remains, I want to get really practical with you, because compassion is not just feeling something. It's feelings that move you to action. So turn with me to Acts chapter 3. How many of you got a, your Bible with you? Let me see. Everybody brought a Bible. Hold it up. Let me see who brought one. The rest of y'all going to take my word for it? I would advise that, man. We've got a blue Bible uh, under the chair in some of our worship centers in the room somewhere. Uh, grab one of those if you want to. Turn to Acts chapter 3, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke, John, Acts, fifth book in the New Testament. We'll start in verse 1. But I'll tell you one of the things we're going to learn as we unpack this passage. If you're going to show compassion to people, you've got to become attentive to the needs all around you. There are needs all around you. And if you're going to be a compassionate person, you've got to put those antennas out and start picking that action up. Look at verse 1. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now a crippled man from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those who were going into the temple courts. Now when we read that word beg, that immediately gives us kind of a, a, a sad and a, and a negative kind of connotation. But I'll tell you, this is how Israel took care of the poor. Now we call it begging, but they call it giving alms. And every follower, uh, every member of the tribe of Israel was commanded you know, to have a compassionate heart. And when you saw somebody who was deeply in need, you gave alms. You gave undeserved gifts to help those people who were in need. It was just part of the culture. It was an expression of compassion. Now, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. Now, apparently he asked for help, but, but he was so filled with shame about his failure to take care of himself that his eyes were down. You know, it's indicative of that that shame that comes so often to people who are in need. And then in verse 5, the man gave them his attention when Peter said, look at us, expecting he was going to get something from them. Now, this guy actually had already been blessed by the Lord. He had friends who showed him compassion by taking him every day to the gate of the temple. Now, do you know why they took him to the gate of the temple? Because in his day, just like in our day, the most generous people in the world are people of faith. And they tend to be the most compassionate to people who are in deep need. Now, the writer of the book of Acts was a doctor. His name was Luke. Uh, he tells us that this man had been crippled from birth, so we know that he had a legitimate need for help. And we also know that everybody who begs, everybody who asks you, does not have a legitimate need for help. We all know that. And, you know, we also know that it's not easy to tell if somebody has a real need or if they're just lying to you, just working you, just trying to use you. And I can think of four or five examples in my mind just like that of times that somebody came and told me some sad story and I helped them and then you know next thing I know they're wasting that money on some frivolous thing or I, I just realized I got worked and I don't like getting worked anybody here like getting worked I, I don't like getting worked but let me tell you something else I know about myself if you're not willing to get used every now and then you won't show much compassion if you're more worried about getting worked than you are about helping you won't help very much. 
And honestly, I would rather risk being used occasionally than be an uncompassionate follower of Jesus because those two things don't go together. Listen, people took advantage of Jesus, but he was still compassionate. Amen? Amen. They took advantage of Jesus, but he remained compassionate. This guy in Acts 3, it's pretty obvious he has a legitimate need. He's been suffering from mobility issues all of his life. So he interrupts Peter on the way to the temple, and Peter is moved to stop and help. Now let's just hit pause here for a moment because we can learn something here. Very often, your best opportunity to show compassion is going to present itself as an interruption. It's not going to be an intentional thing. I'm going to go out and I'm going to serve somebody in the name of Jesus today. Something's going to interrupt you, and that's going to be your opportunity. Now, Ken Blanchard is a business author who came to Christ a few years ago, and I've read everything this guy's written, man. He wrote The One Minute Manager back in the 80s, and I read that like that, and then I read The Raving Fans and Leading at a Higher Level and the Leader Having the Heart of a Leader, and it's all about servant leadership, and I mean, Ken is great, great leadership, great management wisdom, and man, when he started following Christ, his books got better. Uh, but Ken says that one of the dangers that leaders need to face is a temptation over time to stop thinking about the people you work with as partners and start seeing them as interruptions. Because, you know, we all have a plan and we all have stuff we want to do today. But, you know, it seems like everybody's got a question and, and everybody's got some demand and everybody needs some time and, and everybody needs some attention. And, and, you know, if you're not careful, you can start seeing that your partners as, as interruptions. But he says in his book, take a look at the life of Jesus. If it were not for interruptions, Jesus wouldn't have had a ministry. And I mean, there's a lot of truth to that. Everywhere Jesus goes, he is constantly stopping because somebody's in need or stopping because somebody's got a question or stopping to say an encouragement word, or encouraging word to somebody who's down. And maybe we need to learn from Jesus and from Peter and John that sometimes interruptions are our greatest opportunity to show compassion. Now, I want to show you a great example of this. I've shown this uh, to y'all before. This is a video uh, of Maurice Cheeks, uh, who is a professional basketball player and a coach uh, for the Portland Trail Blazers back in the day, when he saw a little girl who had a very unique uh, need for some compassion. Uh, they'd had a week, uh, a contest the week before to see who would get to sing the national anthem uh, at this basketball game. And Natalie Gilbert, a little 13-year-old girl from Oswego, Oregon, won. And uh, let, let's just watch what happens here. If you've never seen this video before, uh, it'll be cool. And if you have, deal with it. All right, let's all stand for the national. <laughs> let's stand for the national anthem and, uh, and watch what happens here, all right? And now to honor America and salute the men and women serving our country with our national anthem, please welcome, as voted by you, the fans, our winner of the Toyota Get the Feeling of a Star promotion, Natalie Gilbert. That's a good man right there, right? He can't sing a lick. That man cannot sing a lick, but he rescued that little girl. Why? Why did he do that? I mean, here is a millionaire 
coach and this little know-nothing girl that didn't practice the national anthem enough. <laughs> and he can't sing, but he put his arm around her and lifted her up and gave her an act of compassion that saved her from terrible humiliation. Why? Because I tell you, they're just people that when they're moved by compassion, they do something. They do something to help. And we see it in our culture and applaud that. Friends, think of the difference it makes when followers of Jesus just live that way. James, the brother of Jesus, said, listen, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but he has no deeds? Can that kind of faith save? I mean, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go, man, I wish you well, keep warm and fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is that? And one of the things that made Peter and John stand out in this story is that when they were walking into the temple that day, their eyes were open. Scripture says that Peter and John looked straight at this guy. They were attentive to the person who was in need all around them. And I'm telling you, just that is going to help us at moving in the right direction. Friends, just feeling compassion is not enough. We need to open our eyes and look for opportunities to act. And if we do, we'll see some of those opportunities all around us. But we'll have to be looking for them because they'll come disguised as interruptions. And I know you get this, but if we're going to choose compassion, this story also teaches us to be responsive with whatever we have, to be responsive with whatever we have. You know, the man asked for money. You know why he asked for money? Because it's easier to ask people to give you money than it is to ask them for what you really need. Clothing, housing, food, counsel, friendship, wisdom, coaching, whatever. Look at verse 6. Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. But what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And then taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. Now, friends, this is a miracle. This is driven by God. It's awesome. It's unexplainable. It's a miracle. The man jumped to his feet and began to walk, even though he'd never taken a step in his life. That's a miracle. Then he went with him into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. That's like a triple miracle, all right? And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him. They said, look, this is the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and everybody was filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, friends, this is a miracle story. Peter and John had miraculous powers that had been given them by the Lord Jesus. They didn't have any money, but they did have the capacity to do miracles, and so they used that capacity to show compassion. Look at that last verse. People were filled with wonder and amazement as they saw what happened. That's what happens when you show compassion. When you show compassion, watch what happens next because it'll be amazing. Friends, that act of compassion lit up the darkness like a city set on a hill. Everybody could see the good deeds they were doing in the name of Jesus. Now, one of the secrets to choosing compassion is to look for opportunities in areas where you already have a passion, where you already have capacity. Listen, compassion is driven by passion. Now, if you like kids, I want to encourage you to keep your eyes open for opportunities to show compassion to kids. Now, I get to travel internationally every now and then with our missions pastor, Dave Stewart, because we like to go to the places we support, a little quality control trip, just make sure they're doing with the money what they say, all right? And every time I get to the mission field with Dave, I am amazed at what a kid magnet he is. I mean, he just is. He is a kid magnet. I don't care where we go, he's picking on kids or teasing them or throwing them around or kicking a soccer ball with them. And I mean, he's just like a Pied Piper for kids, which is a cool thing. But let me just tell you, that man is mentoring a young man right here in Savannah, Georgia, called Olavius Howard. Olavius is a student right here in Savannah. And he took Olavius to the Chatham County Commissioner's meeting last month. They'd asked me to pray out of death of my family. I called Dave, can you pick me up? He said, sure. He goes down to the Chatham County Commissioner's to do the opening prayer with Olavius. And he introduces Olavius. And then asks Olavius to say the prayer for the Chatham County Commissioner's. And I'm telling you, there was not a dry eye in that place as they heard Olavius pray for the men in our community to do for others what Dave was doing for him. Now, maybe you used to coach kids years ago, but you retired because you graduated or you got out of school and you quit playing ball or whatever. I want to encourage you to get back in the game, man. Volunteer to work with middle school students here at our church or elementary students or high school students. Be a godly coach in, in Little League rec leagues. Be a, be a Christian man or woman in the rec leagues in our community and bring those kids to compassion. If you like working on cars, man, and you just love to turn wrenches, volunteer with our men's ministry when they do an oil change for single moms and elderly women, which they've got one coming up right now. 
If you'd like to swing a hammer, man, get in our Few Good Men, which is a ministry that takes care of repair issues for senior adults in our community. Or go to the Lighthouse. Man, we care for a thousand families a month who are struggling with scarcity through the Lighthouse. Now, friends, here's the crazy secret about compassion. If you start showing compassion in an area that you are passionate about, you won't just light up the darkness. It'll light you up too. It's an amazing thing. Martin Siegelman is a professor at Harvard. He wrote a book called Authentic Happiness. He's a psychologist who is intrigued by what actually causes real joy. Now, you know, we can all get a stab of joy from eating a burrito or buying something or whatever. He's talking about, you know, long, joyful life, all right? Now, in his book, he... <laughs> I see some of y'all thinking about that, whatever. Stop thinking about that, all right? In his book, he says that we all tend to think if we could just get more of the stuff that we like, that we would be happy. You know, more money, more sex, more chocolate, more success, more achievement, you know, more stuff. If we could just get more stuff, we'd all be happy, right? But the problem, he says, is there's a gap between more and enough. And that gap is impossible to fill with stuff. So more stuff is never going to be enough. It's kind of like the old joke. Who's more content? The man who has 12 children or the man who has a, 12, has a million dollars? Who's more content? Of course, the man with 12 children because he doesn't want any more. <laughs> that's bad. I'm sorry I said that, y'all. The guy with a million wants 10 million. You know, that's what I'm trying to say, all right? Now, in one of his classes, uh, Siegelman gave a fascinating assignment. He told all of his students, here's what I want you to do, two things. I want you to go out and just do whatever you love to do. Just whatever you love to do. And then I want you to go out and commit an act of compassion. And then I want you to write a term paper on your reflections on those two experiences. And here's what he writes in his book. The results were life-changing. The afterglow of the pleasurable activity, you know, hanging out with your friends, watching a movie, eating a hot fudge Sunday, whatever it was, paled in comparison to the effects of one act of compassion. He says, you know, it's ironic that when people's primary focus is on making themselves happy, they struggle with depression. But when you're focused on giving yourself to others, you get joy thrown in for free. I'll never forget the morning a single mom met me right down in the bullpen at our old worship center, crying, tears running down her face because our church had given her a minivan. She couldn't believe it. I said, well, you know, sometimes uh, people in our church, rather than trading in a car, if they don't need the trade-in value, they just donate it to the church. And then we've got some compassion Christian, you know, mechanics, and they'll come in and they'll go through that van and, and make sure it's, you know, all running right, mechanically right. And then it's just an honor for us to pass it on to somebody who has a legitimate need. And she told me about how that gift of transportation was just going to change her situation, how excited her kids were about it, how much that gift meant to her. And, you know, for, for me, as just the pastor. I mean, it's just an opportunity for me to, to see somebody in our church commit an act of compassion, somebody else in our church, work on an act of compassion and see what happens. And what happens is awesome. Now, you don't have to give a car to see that happen. A car is a big gift, but let me tell you, we distribute about once, one a month because of compassionate people in our church. But just to get you moving, we have developed a compassion starter kit, okay, that I want to share with you for free, okay? So, I can't believe I'm getting ready to say this, but Take out your cell phone. <laughs> Take out your cell phone and dial this number right now, okay? 313, not, not dial it, text it. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm one generation behind, all right? Text this number right here, 31313. Just take your cell phone out right now. Come on, I'm waiting on you. You've been sneaking around. You don't have to sneak now. Come on, all right? Uh, you know, dial 313131. Uh, not dial it, text it, all right? And when you text it, this is what it should look like. And then when you text that number in the message area, just put whatever campus you go to church. You, you're at the Henderson campus, so just write Compassion Henderson and hit send, okay? And here's what will happen. It will send you to a website that's going to give you about 100 different suggestions, not on random acts of kindness. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about specific acts of compassion. And we've actually developed five different categories of compassionate acts and one of these is going to be perfect for you. When you get to that website, the first thing you'll see is go stealth, right? Now, go stealth is when you do something compassionate incognito. You don't let anybody know. You don't want any credit for it. You don't even want anybody to know about it. This is so much fun. But, man, I'm telling you, nobody wants to meet a secret agent for God, but everybody wants to meet a secret servant from God. Amen? And I'm telling you, this is what go stealth means. Anybody can edge the driveway of an elderly person. 
but to try to do it without her catching you. <laughs> try and do it without them knowing who did it. Paint and don't let them know. Wash the car, fix the car, change the tire. Don't let them know. Man, if you can do that, it's fun. And it's just a blessing. Or you can go inspire. Man, there are all kind of opportunities that are listed here. You know, ways that you can build other people up. You know, do something for somebody in need, somebody who's suffering with an illness. A thank you note to your postman. Just do something, just speak in a word of encouragement to somebody who doesn't expect it. It's inspiring. Or you can go invest. Man, there are relational opportunities just building into other people's lives by investing time over time. That's what my buddy Dave is doing with Alavius. He's investing in that young man's life. That young man's life is going to be changed because of that investment. You could adopt a grandparent in a nursing home or assistant living facility or mentor kids. Or, man, there's just all kind of opportunities listed there. Or you could go sweat. You know, some of us just like to get our hands dirty, man. We just like something we can see immediate gratification from. And there are all kind of opportunities to get your hands dirty in ways that just show the compassion of Christ. And then the most, I think, the, the most fun is to go together. You know, you get a crew of your guys together, or, man, you get your life group together, or you get your family together. Friends, it's always more fun to serve, and it's more rewarding when we serve the Lord together. And it's just a bunch of suggestions here on how your life group or how your family can show compassion as a group, and then just see what happens. Now, what I really wish is that you would jump on one of these every week this month that you're passionate about, and then email me and tell me what happened and send me some pictures so we can talk about it. Now, I really wish you would do that. Uh, we could celebrate what God is doing, and it would be awesome. Now, I know what some of y'all are thinking, Cam, no, 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 bro. I'm a stealth guy. I, I don't want to be bragging about what I did. I want the Lord to get the glory. And, and I get that. I, I absolutely get that. But if your example inspired 50 more people to get in the game, that would be a glory accelerator for God, right? So if you can... Man, share with me what God is doing through you. Or even better, try and catch some other compassion Christian doing an act of compassion and take a picture of it and send it to me and I'll bust them out in front of everybody. They'll never know where it came from, all right? <laughs> It'll be great. It'll be great. Now, I know, listen, I, I appreciate y'all dialing. 313131, put it back up here for us, guys, will you? This is the number. Can, you, can we do that? Yeah. This is the number, 313131. At the end of this service, I will receive a report from, of how many of y'all texted that number. And so I just want to say, don't listen to this with somebody else. I'm talking to you. You need to take a step. If we're going to call ourselves compassion Christian, we need to take steps toward a life of compassion and then see what happens. Now, if you don't have a phone or you got a dumb phone, we got this stuff all printed out for you <laughs> at Connecting Point. And listen, I love dumb phone. I like the dumb phone better, to be honest with you, right? Uh, but we got it all at Connecting Point. Grab one on the way out and you'll be good to go. Listen, Peter and John lit their world up that day because they chose to show compassion with what they had. Not what they didn't have, but with what they did have. Imagine what would happen this year if every compassion Christian starts looking for an opportunity to do the same. All right, let's wrap this up. Look back at verse 11, and we'll see what choosing compassion. Choosing compassion only has its full effect when you are aggressive about pointing people to Jesus. Look at verse 11. Let's, we'll just walk through the end of this story. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade, which is just a, a porch with pillars on one side of the temple. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? He's like, dude, seriously, you don't think we're heroes because we did this. Listen, if it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't give a rip about this guy. If it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't have stopped. If it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't have had the power to help. It's not... It's not about me. It's about God working through me. Notice that immediately they deflect glory to God. They are not going to take credit for the outcome of this compassion because they know if it weren't for Jesus, they wouldn't care. And they certainly wouldn't be doing it. And that's why I want to encourage you also to go as a team when you show compassion because they show compassion to this guy as a team. Peter and John were part of a life group that Jesus put together. They were still part of that life group. And man, they were part of this life-changing life group that went into the temple to show the compassion of Jesus together and man, changed this old man's life. Now in the lobby on every campus today, you'll find folks at Connecting Point who can get you hooked up into a life group and they'll do it this week. And then just like Peter and John, you will make friends in that life group and you'll learn and grow in that life group and you'll give and you'll receive compassion in that life group. Friends, the best part of Savannah Christian does not happen in this building. It happens in life groups. Hundreds of life groups in every neighborhood in our region. You need to be in one of those. It's the best part of our church. Listen, I got two friends 
who are struggling with cancer today. I've talked to both of them this week, and they've told me how their life group has brought food over and prayer and help and, and loved and text and encouraged and called. And how do people do this without a life group? I'm like, I don't know. My question is, why would you? Why would you want to? Now listen, you need to be in a life group before you need a life group. Peter and John and Jesus were in a group. I want to encourage you to get in one as well. But listen, Peter and John were also leveraging the power of relationships when they chose compassion for this hurting man and then boldly pointed him to Jesus. Look what they say in verse 13. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You're trying to give us credit for healing this man? Let me tell you what it's about. It's about Jesus. You handed Jesus over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, even though he decided to let him go. You killed the author of life. You know you did. You remember 60 days ago you were chanting, crucify him, crucify him. But God raised him from the dead. And we are all witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is in Jesus' name and faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him as we can all see. Friends, I am so amazed at how bold Peter and John are as they just point people to Jesus. They don't take credit for the help they're able to give and they don't soft sell the fact that they got their power and inspiration from the Lord. They know that healing that guy, he's still gonna die. He's still gonna get sick. He will bust hell wide open if he doesn't meet the Lord Jesus. And that's, uh, that's why they take that guy and everybody else and say, look, this is awesome, it's cool, it's wonderful. But if you don't know Jesus, it doesn't mean a thing. They wanted everybody to know that it was the love of Christ that changed their lives and will change your lives too. Look at verse 17. Brothers, I know you acted in ignorance as did your leaders when y'all put Jesus to death. But if you will repent and if you will turn to God, your sins will be wiped out and times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And you know, last weekend, I was talking to one of my friends in the lobby here at this Henderson campus and he told me I had a heart attack. And I was like, dude, are you okay? He said, man, I'm doing great. And he started telling me about a heart attack and how he come back from it and all that and how wonderful it was. And then he says, Cam, do you know how many nurses there are at the hospital that are members of Savannah Christian Church? I was like, I never heard of Savannah Christian Church. You talking about Compassion Christian Church? He's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I said, a lot. There are a lot of nurses in the hospitals that come to our church. He said, I know, I met most of them, I'm pretty sure. He said, they took care of me. They comforted me. They invited me to church. They invited me to my own church. They prayed for me. He said, I was amazed at how gracious and yet aggressive these godly men and women were in using their job to minister to me. And I thought, thank God. The church is finally working right. Amen? Amen. Compassion Christians, let your light shine before men so they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Father, thank you for this time you've given us to be together. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Father, for the, the way you work in our lives and, and you show your compassion to us. And I pray, God, that there will be people here today who will receive it and whose lives will be changed by it and who will become life changers because of your compassion. And we pray this in Jesus' strong name and all God's people said... You know what I love about God? He teaches us to be just like him. Who was it that taught Peter and John to be attentive to the needs that are all around you? It was Jesus. And friends, he is attentive to you. He knows what you're going through right now. He knows what you're going through alone because you're too scared to tell anybody. He knows what you're going, along, going through right now alone because you got your feelings hurt by God or got your feelings hurt by the church and now you've isolated yourself and you're living without him. He is attentive to your need and he is responsive. He's worked in your life to get you to this place right now. Through a thousand different little things, he's brought you to this place right now so that he can show his compassion to you. He can show his mercy to you. You know, Romans chapter three says it is the mercy of God that leads us to repentance. It's the mercy, the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the acceptance of God, the blessing of God that leads us to want to be a part of his family, to want to have our sins forgiven, to want to have the Holy Spirit come and live inside us, to want to be part 
of a compassionate family. And I'm telling you, if you've never given your life to Christ today, he's reaching out to you. He brought you here today on purpose. I hope you will come and give your life to Christ. Meet me down front, hug my neck. Tell me you want to meet the Lord. I'll have somebody introduce you to him. If you're here today and you've already given your life to Christ, come and join our church, man. We are going to bomb this city with compassion. Amen? It is going to happen. There's going to be an explosion of compassion. It's going to go out from right here, and we want you to be a part of that. But if you need to feel the compassion of God today, why don't you come and let us pray with you too. If your heart is broken, your heart is heavy, you want to feel the compassion of God, come and hug my neck down here and say, man, I need compassion. And we'll pray that God will send. He'll send it to you. So let's stand and let's sing this commitment song. I'll meet you right down front. If you want to experience the compassion of God, come. Come today. Here we go.